everybody, and welcome back to our final session in our study that we're calling Raising Your Kids Without Raising Your Blood Pressure. This session is all about giving hope to hurting parents. Why is it that godly parents sometimes have kids that go astray? It happens all the time. It happens in the Bible, in church history. In fact, some of the most godly men and women I know have kids who have gone off the deep end. Why? I don't think there is a, a single universal answer. Sometimes we never know. There are all sorts of factors, and I think a lot of parents carry a lot of guilt thinking that they're the only thing responsible for their kids. But they're not. There are all sorts of other factors in life that you don't have any control over when it comes to your children, especially your older children who are beginning to make their own decisions. Today, I want us to take a look at the story of the prodigal son or the lost son. It's a famous parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. This is one of Jesus's most famous parables. It's not just a lesson about God's love, it's a story that gives hope for hurting parents. It's also a lesson about human parenting that illustrates what you do when your children are legally independent and you don't control them anymore and they rebel against everything that you've taught them. I'm not going to talk about why it happens because I don't know all the reasons why. I want to talk about what do you do if and when it happens. And when you look at this story that Jesus tells, you'll notice that there are three stages in the story. The first stage is the rebellion of the son. Starting in verse 11, Jesus says this, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. So stage one is rebellion. In every parent-child relationship, there is going to be a struggle for control, a power struggle. Who's in charge? At birth, as a parent, when your child is newly born, you're 100% in control. But as children grow older, the power begins to get transferred. Your, your control isn't permanent, and it shouldn't be. But typically, kids want control sooner than we want to give it, and therein lies the battle. So in this story, we have a classic confrontation. In verse 12, the son says, Father, give me. I want you to circle that little phrase, give me. That's actually the root of rebellion. If I can just do as I please, if I can just be my own boss, if I don't have to answer to anyone, life would be great. Rebellion is unpredictable. You don't know when it's gonna come and by which child. The man has two sons and they're radically different. One is strong-willed, the other is complacent. You can never tell which one is gonna be the rebellious one. It's not age-related. In this case, it's the younger son who caused the problems. In verse 13, it says, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And remember, when he gathered all he had, that included his half of his inheritance that he had demanded or asked for early from his dad. So evidently, this, this guy is old enough to be out on his own. He's grown beyond his parents' control. His father couldn't keep him at home, so I imagine this son was at least 18 or 19 years old. So what do you do when they are legally independent and you can't control them anymore? This father made three difficult choices, and I think he's a model for us because in this parable, he represents God, and God is the perfect father. So, so what do you do when you can't control your child anymore? And they're going to go live a lifestyle that is opposite of what you would hope they would do. Here's the first choice the father made. Let them go. Let them go. The Bible says the younger son set off for a distant country and the father didn't chase him. He released him. 
I think one of the most difficult tasks of parenting is knowing when to let go. It's hard. And this may, it might have seemed foolish to the father to just let his son leave, probably in the back of his mind, knowing it might not turn out so well. And no doubt, he probably tried to reason with his son, but to no avail, the young man was determined to leave. The fact is, oftentimes, the tighter we hold on, the more they resist. We have to let them go and entrust them into God's hands. And that's hard. The second choice the father made was even harder. Let them make their own mistakes. Oh, that's hard. Verse 13 says, He squandered his wealth, talking about the son, he squandered his wealth in wild living. He took everything his dad had given him and he blew it. He wasted it all. He's out having a good time and living it up on his father's dime. He probably tried everything, everything out there, especially the stuff that were forbidden at home, right? All the stuff he was never allowed to do, he probably went out there and that's the stuff he was doing. He tossed his parents' values and their valuables to the wind. The father realized that there are some things we only learn through experience and pain. This kid was stubborn, and the only way he was going to learn was through the school of hard knocks. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30 says, Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. It's hard to let them go, and it's even harder to let them make their own mistakes. Then the father made what I think is the hardest choice of all. Let them reap the consequences of their own choices. I can't tell you how many parents I've talked to who think the loving thing to do is to spare their child from consequences of their choices. It makes sense. We hate to see our kids suffer. But when we do that, it only reinforces their bad behavior. In the story that Jesus is telling, he says this about the son. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. <laughs> that part of the story reminds us that there is a price tag for rebellion. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The boy went from party time to hard times. He was broke and friendless. He had empty pockets, an empty stomach, and he had an empty life. He had finally hit rock bottom. The son was reaping the consequences of his own choices. And, and how do you think his father felt when he heard rumors about what his son was doing and how his son was living. He probably felt sorry. I mean, he was probably thinking, my kid is out there suffering. I can't just let him sit there in a pig pen eating pig slop. He, he might have felt embarrassed. You know, here's a wealthy businessman and his kid's out living on the streets. The, pro the father probably felt some level of self-condemnation. Where did we go wrong? How do we fail as parents? The fact is, all of us make mistakes in parenting, but you're not the only influence in your child's life. I think there's a lot of false guilt, a lot of unjustified self-condemnation. It's not right to take all the blame yourself. There are forces beyond your control. Your child has choices that he makes. She has friends that, that she chooses. He has teachers that you don't control. He has books and movies and websites that he sees and visits and watch. She has all kinds of influence and choices other than mom and dad. God is a perfect parent, yet Adam rebelled. And Adam was in a perfect, loving environment. Was God to blame for Adam's sin? No. Adam had a free will. We all do. So don't carry an unreal load of guilt over your child's rebellion. So the son is reaping the consequences of his own decisions. He spent everything and now he's in need. In this moment, there's a great temptation as parents. 
and that is to intervene, to send the care package, to wire the money, to bail them out of their troubles. And as a youth pastor, I've seen it happen dozens, maybe hundreds of times. Parents who bail their children out time after time because they just can't stand to see them suffer. But the father in this story knew something very important that all of us have to learn. The father didn't intervene. He let his son hit rock bottom. Nature has a way of disciplining our children in ways that we can't. Don't short circus the natural process. Let them reap the consequences of their own decisions. It's those kinds of things that we remember the longest. Now again, just as a side note, remember in this story and the focus of this lesson is when our children are a little bit older and they're going astray, the younger they are, the more we intervene, the more grace we give, the more we bail them out. As they get older, they have to begin to reap more and more the consequences, more and more the consequences. This story is dealing with a much older, almost young adult age child. Therefore, the dad was making some decisions that he probably wouldn't have made when his child was just a little bit younger. That was just a side note. Now, because the dad didn't intervene, they came to stage two of the story. And that is reevaluation, regret, and repentance. Reevaluation, regret, and repentance. The Bible says this in the story, this is a story that Jesus is telling, when he came to his senses, talking about the son, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Says that in in Luke 15 verses 17 through 19. Notice the change in the son's attitude. He starts with reevaluation. It says he came to his senses. Some of you are praying for that in your children's lives. When is my child going to wake up? When is he going to come to his senses? When is she going to see that she's ruining her life? The fact is we never change until we get desperate. God has to get our attention. Next, we see the son begin to regret his choices. He says, my dad's servants get better treatment than this. So he says, here's my idea. I'll go home and I'll ask my father to make me like one of his servants. And he heads home. And he's not heading home for a change of clothes. He's really heading home because he's beginning to have a change of heart. And that is the beginning of repentance. Notice the difference. In verse 12, he said, Father, give me. But when he comes home in verse 19, he says, Father, I'm no longer worthy. The consequences of his own choices have begun to break him. What do you do during this stage while you're waiting for your child to finally come to her senses? I think there are three things that we can do. First, pray. Pray and pray and never stop praying. Our children, my children, your children, they are targets of Satan. From the day they take their very first breath, Satan is trying to ruin their lives. They need to be prayed for. One of our chief responsibilities as parents is to pray for our children every day. The second thing to do is commit. Commit them to God. Things are out of our control most of the time, but they're not out of God's control. Although we may not be able to change the situation, God can commit them to the Lord. And the third thing to do is wait. Many of you are doing that right now. That's a hard season, but there's always a waiting period. It takes longer for some, but whatever you do, don't short circuit nature's discipline. Because the father waited, the son came to stage three. And stage three is the return. And how you handle the return is crucial. So as we pick up the story, here's what we're going to see. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Notice, 
the father did three things. Now, remember in the parable, in the story that Jesus is telling, the father represents God. This is what God does to you in your rebellion, but it's a model for us. He wants us to do three things. First, love them faithfully. This is stubborn love. You never give up. It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Not when he had come back home and got his life all together and groveled. The father was filled with compassion while his son was still a long way off. The father had never given up hope. No matter how far they fall, no matter how long you wait, the door is open for reconciliation. You love them faithfully. Second, accept them unconditionally. It says his father ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Notice, he didn't set any conditions for acceptance. He didn't say, hey, go home, get shaved, get a haircut, take a bath, and then I'll hug you. <laughs> Can you imagine how this guy probably smelled? He's been living in a pig pen, but what does his father do? He runs out and gives him a big bear hug and kisses him. It's unconditional acceptance. Some of you might be saying, how can I accept my child back without lowering my standards? How, how can I accept my child when I don't approve at all of their lifestyle? The problem is this. We oftentimes confuse acceptance with approval, and there's a very big difference. You see, acceptance says, I love you because you're my child. God made you and I love you, but I don't approve of what you're doing. You can accept a child or a person without approving of their lifestyle. When you accept them unconditionally, it makes it so much easier for them to admit that they've been wrong. Look at the son's confession in verse 21. After the hug, after the kiss. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Confession is much easier when you know you've already been accepted. I think a very important question we need to ask ourselves is, do your children know it's safe to come home? Do you make it easy for your kids to admit when they're wrong? Or do you hold it over their heads? Do you make them come home groveling? Do you make it easy for your kids to say, I was wrong, mom. I was wrong, dad. Most likely, we need to do some confession too. When the prodigal son comes home and says, Dad, I blew it, you can say, ah, I'm sure I made some mistakes along the way too. We've all made mistakes. I think there needs to be some mutual confession, some mutual restoration. Love them faithfully and accept them unconditionally. And third, forgive them completely. The dad didn't bring up any of the son's failures. He didn't wait for him to prove himself. In verse 22, it says, The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. What I love about this father is he didn't rub it in, he wiped it out. He didn't keep reminding his son and holding it over his head the rest of his life. Remember that time when you rebelled? Never again will I trust you. Remember that time you disobeyed me? When you disavowed my trust? When you broke the relationship? Never again will I forget that. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I told you so. He could have. He was probably tempted to. He didn't say, you blew half of my wealth. The prodigal son didn't need a sermon. He needed a second chance. And that's what his father gave him. He forgave him completely. Notice, he, he, he did three things. First, he said, bring the best robe. In ancient Jewish culture, the robe was a sign of sonship. What he's saying is, you're back in the family. Then he said, put a ring on his finger. In those days, the ring was a signet that you would use to, to stamp and wax to sign your name to bills. It was like a, like a credit card. He's basically saying, I trust you, son. You're forgiven completely. And by doing that, he gave him some responsibility. He didn't allow his son to move into a, a dependent relationship. The father made him act like an adult. And then he put sandals on his feet. And when he did that, he was restoring his dignity. 
The father restored his son back to full relationship. This story has a, a happy ending. But the truth is this. For many of you, you feel like the jury's still out. You've got a child out there that you don't know if they're ever going to shape up. You don't know yet how they're really going to turn out. Maybe they've rejected everything in your life and they've hurt you deeply. Maybe they've ridiculed your values or they've rejected your counsel. They've rebelled against your authority. You're hurt, angry, embarrassed. Perhaps you're taking all the blame on yourself and you're wondering, why has this happened? What can you do? The only thing I can suggest in those seasons is the most powerful thing, and that is to give your hurts to God. And that's what we said in this whole series. You, you, you give your hurts to God. He's the only one who can heal them. You need to remember that the ball game isn't over. Right now, some of your children may be in the third inning, and there's still plenty of time left for God to do a miracle in their lives. I've seen it happen time and time and time again. So keep praying, committing them to God, and keep waiting in faith. He knows where they are, and he knows what they need. The question you have to answer is not, what did you do wrong? The question you need to answer is, will you be ready to do your part when they come home? Let's pray. Father, I pray for those of us who have wayward children, children who have gone astray. Father, we ask that you would please bring them home, first to a, to a restored relationship with you, and second, with their family. Father, I ask that you would help each and every parent watching this video, sharing together in their groups, that you would help each and every one of us to navigate the tough waters of raising children the very, very best we can. Father, thank you that we don't have to do so all alone. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for being part of this study on how to raise your kids without raising your blood pressure. Have a great discussion time with your group.